OK, good morning, everybody, and um, welcome to the Embark Group's webinar on intergenerational planning. We've got two excellent sessions this morning. We've got Neil Smith of the Embark Group. Um, he's been reviewing re the main drivers of intergenerational planning and the issues that your clients may experience. And then following Neil, we've got David Holmes from Thornton's Investments. We'll be discussing the areas of business relief and how investments in the AIM market may be a, a suitable solution to IHT planning. My name is Craig Spittle. I'm head of key accounts in Embark. I'll work closely with the key account managers that you deal with on a day to day basis and have all helped to put on today's session. You've all got the ability to ask questions via the Q&A facility, so you should see a, like a question mark towards the top of the screen. Or if on an iPad, obviously you need to touch the screen to, um, to open that up. Please type in your questions as we go. Um, I'll put these to Neil and David at the end of the session if we've got enough time. Um, if we do time out for, for any reason, we will, of course, come back to you individually. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Neil um, and thank you, Neil. Over to you. Thank you, Craig. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar. Now, if I was to give this presentation a subtitle, I'd call it Be Nice to Your Parents. And you will see why over the next few minutes. Keeping with the parental theme, if we travel back in time to 1986, the financial guru Warren Buffett said, Parents should leave their children enough so they can do anything, but not enough that they can do nothing. Wise words indeed. But that's not to say that Buffett's kids haven't received anything from their dad. Each child has a $2 billion foundation, so his idea of scraping by is perhaps a bit different to us mere mortals. The point being, I guess, that if wealth is passed across in a controlled way during lifetime, it can be proactively used by the next generations. There's a rising dependence of younger generations on inheritances. So the challenge is to not only preserve family wealth, but effectively cascade it down the generations during lifetime. Whilst the concept of intergenerational planning has been around for many years in the UK, it's advisors in the United States that seem to have embraced it and are actively working with clients to address some of the obstacles. With that in mind, we're going to look to the states for some of their research. Now, and also to keep you on your toes, hidden across this presentation are 11 song titles and lyrics from across the generations spanning the 1960s to the 90s. There's no prize for spotting them all, I'm afraid, as that would be an inducement. As a hint, no, the first one is in front of you now. It's a family affair, Sly and the Family Stone from 1971. So let's take a nanosecond or two to peruse these legal words I'm obliged to show you by my, my compliance department. Effectively, they're saying if it all goes horribly wrong, it's not mine or Embark's fault. Well, enough of that. Let's have a look at the learning objectives. These tie in nicely with our agenda and you'll receive CPD in due course. So what exactly are we going to cover during this session? We're going to look at the issues affecting the different generations, how tax wrappers can be used to cascade family wealth in a controlled way. Keeping control is perhaps one of the most crucial factors, as you will see. Lastly, we'll take a look at how technology and platforms can help. Obviously, no prizes for guessing which platform I'm going to be talking about. But of course, intergenerational planning is a huge subject. We won't be able to cover everything in our limited time. However, I'm pleased to say our chums from Thorntons who are coming up after me will certainly assist with the inheritance tax angle. So let's start with the size of the prize, something which is known as the greatest transfer of wealth in history. It's widely reported that we are already in the midst of this great transfer of wealth and something like 5.5 trillion pounds will pass between the generations over the next 30 years or so. The part that stands out to me in particular is that something like 70% of household wealth in the UK is held by the over 50s. Why do the over 50s hold all the wealth? Well, I guess generous pensions, home ownership and free education have all played a part. Dare I say it, access to credit cards, bank loans, store cards, personal car purchase arrangements and online buy now, pay later schemes were much less available too. And of course, generous grandparents will help cascade that wealth. Maybe we should add another subtitle, be nice to your granny. So this is a massive opportunity for us all, or is it? Perhaps the most worrying fact is that according to research from the USA, two thirds of advisors are sacked by their clients' kids. Now, why would you suppose that is? But the key reason is there was no relationship with the beneficiaries. It wasn't because they were poor advisors. So why, why bother with this intergenerational planning thing? Well, quite simply, the right money in the right hands at the right time. 
But when we think of intergenerational planning in the UK, we often go straight to IHT, and, and quite rightly so. Most transfers of wealth tend to happen either just before or just after death. But unless we ensure that different generations are looked after, we may simply just be kicking the can down the road and passing the problem on to the next generation. Transferring wealth earlier on will offer many potential benefits to the different generations, as you will see from the next slide. So back, uh, back in time, Donald Trump said, my father gave me a very small loan in 1975 and I built it into a company worth many, many billions of dollars. Hillary Clinton said, he started his business with $14 million borrowed from his father. I'm not being political here, I'm just merely demonstrating effective intergenerational wealth transfer. As soon as his kids were born, Fred Trump began transferring his wealth to them. According to the New York Times, Donald was a millionaire by the age of eight. And that over his lifetime, he's received something like $413 million, if you adjust it for inflation, from his dad, Fred's business empire. But long story short, a great example of intergenerational wealth transfer that benefits both donor and recipient. So whilst we're talking on the subject of Americans, let's look at a minute at some of this research that's coming out of the States. Now we can see a lack of planning accelerates the loss of family wealth. And I'm going to highlight two numbers here. Highlight the number 70. Now, US research found 70% of family wealth is lost by the end of the second generation or by the time the kids pass away. And then with number 90, building on that last point, 90% of the family's wealth is lost by the time the next generation passes. Who or what is to blame? Well, we're clearly paying off debts, medical costs and estate tax will all play a part. But it's nothing to do with bad planning or errors. It's all to do with a lack of communication, a lack of trust and unprepared heirs. And why is that? Well, what well, taboo is, that is uh, money is a, is a taboo subject. Do you talk to your parents or your kids about money? The subject creates powerful emotions. If you sit back and think about yourself for a minute, what does money mean to you? For some people, it equates to love, others security, freedom, power, and in some cases, fear. But fear is quite often a dominant emotion when it comes to intergenerational planning. Fear about running out of money yourself if you give too much away too quickly. Fear of creating an entitlement mentality amongst your kids. Fear of heirs squandering their inheritance. Perhaps the fear of causing a sibling rivalry or fear of outside influences. And, and I'm talking about the dreaded sideways inheritance here, but more of that later. And fear now that planning may, may limit your future options. Now, if you've, ever, if you've got clients that procrastinate and leave everything to the last minute, laboring under the view that something better will come along, You'll know what I'm talking about. So it's all about developing family relationships and transferring wealth to, during a client's lifetime, but keeping that important control. Now, here we get to see the different generations and how they prefer to make financial decisions. Now, quite often when we do this presentation live, you may remember live presentations. I do hear they're making a comeback. We ask the audience to put their hands up and show us which generations they look after. All the hands tend to stay up for the first three generations and then they start to come down by the time we get to generations Y and Z. I think the analogy I'd use here is that it's similar to looking after a business. You could consider grandparents could be directors, parents, key employees and so on. If one of the directors or, or key workers sadly passes away, we want that business to continue to prosper. Why wouldn't we want that for a family? and their wealth. So at this point of the, the uh, presentation, I get to insult all of the different generations in turn. So we'll start with the maturists, also known as the silent generation, the generation that didn't spend what they didn't have, love a good letter and used to hold the bank manager in high regard. Great news being this generation want financial advice from you in person. Then we get on to the baby boomer generation. This is where the majority of today's wealth currently sits in the UK. From a marketing perspective, this generation love a bargain. Um, and surprisingly, a, a very adept at online research. Their marketing uh, gurus tell us they favor financial websites with informative material where they can really get a feel for a subject. If we take the maturists and, and baby boomers together, as I said earlier, it's estimated 70% of the UK's wealth currently sits with these two generations. And again, great news. This generation prefer financial advice from you in person, but would be happy to go online and get it if need be. Then we get on to Generation X. Now, this is my generation. I'm resentful of the wealth of the older generations and envious of the lifestyles and fun the younger generations are having. But from a marketing perspective, Generation X want to be treated as individuals, not part of the herd. Again, we prefer face to face advice. However, would go online as a second choice. And this is where it gets quite, you know, a bit more interesting, I reckon. This We've got Generation Y, the millennial generation. 
Well, that's effectively someone that would have reached 18 round about the turn of the century, hence the name millennials. Also unfairly called the snowflake generation by some parts of the mainstream press. A generation that's very tech savvy. Now, indeed, research from a few years back from KPMG mentioned that two thirds of this generation would happily swap banks based on the technology available by how good the online and mobile experience was, not on the bank's product offering or pricing structure. Now, a lesson I reckon for all financial service providers there. Surprisingly, this generation of thought to actually prefer making financial decisions face to face with advisors rather than online. So they're great news. But then we get to Generation Z, a generation that's even more into technology than any other. Seemingly everything should be online for this generation, and they're more likely to take notice of social media when it comes to making financial decisions. Now, at first I thought, you know, this is odd and, and potentially dangerous. But then I remember back in the day, you'd have the influence of uh, the man or the lady down the pub or, or at the golf club on, on previous generations. So maybe not so different after all, just a different medium. The real test, perhaps, when considering the inequalities between the generations is that generations Y and Z are 55 percent less likely to own their own homes at the same age their mum and dad did. And of course, the irony isn't lost on me now that when we consider how most generations prefer face to face meetings pretty much over the last 18 months, all we've done is engage online. So it leads, it leads us nicely onto this slide. So, so better to understand the needs of clients, advisors across the pond ask themselves these three questions. If one of your client's parents passed away, would your client call you? I expect they would. In fact, the research suggests something like 85 percent would get in touch. But in practice, quite often the advisor contact got skewed by the involvement of the family lawyer or executors dealing with the will or a power of attorney. Now, talking of power of attorneys, do you know how many of your clients are named as executors or actually had a or hold a power of attorney? Something like only 1% of the UK population is thought to have a lasting power of attorney. And of that 1%, 38% are actually granted in favour of local authorities or social services, as opposed to being for the ultimate benefit of the family. But the big question, of course, if one of your clients passed away, would their kids call you? Research suggests not, but remember, we are talking about research from the US. It's reckoned something like one in five would actually make contact, which I suppose is why 66% of advisors in the States are dumped by their clients' kids when they pass away. Therefore, open conversations, financial education for heirs and advanced planning are critical to protecting the future of estates. As an industry, and I'm talking about providers and banks here as well, we need to extend our relationships with the families of our clients. What questions should we be asking clients and their families? Well, again, pointing back to the US, planning firms there have shown us that answers to the questions you can see on the screen will help clients express fears, their attitudes, goals about wealth and how they want to pass it on or not as the case may be. In summary, it's all about attitudes to money, good communication, and perhaps more importantly, controlling the transfer of wealth. If you're thinking, yeah, so what? I mean, research has meant that, that an increase in family members keeping assets with advisors if these questions are answered. But enough about the States, let's go back to the UK. Now, here we're going to see some examples of how UK advisor businesses have adapted for intergenerational planning and some of the perceived benefits of doing so. We picked these up from workshops we, we used to run pre-COVID and all the points listed come from advisors who attended. One advisor that attended said he encouraged his clients to fund their kids advice. OK, he earned fees from this. However, the main reason was to establish a relationship with those children. Another advisor said he offered financial reviews for the children of his best clients at his own expense. And that was from the ages of 18 to 30. Now, half the attendees in the room that day looked at him as though he were mad, but the other half congratulated him on what they thought was a great idea. You'll have your own views, I'm sure. But why did he do it? Because by the time the kids were 30, he knew they would be his, but not in a yaha, now you're mine kind of way. He knew they would stay as his clients going forward. Um, a lady present told us how she always visited her clients over Christmas. She knew the different generations of the family would be there. Again, you're going to have your own views as to whether this is better received than carol singers turning up on your doorstep at Christmas. But the one that really I really like is stories. I love this one. It's to make the younger generations understand the sentimental value of any monies passed down. 
I explain to my kids that the reason I'm always in a bad mood is that I'm slaving away over presentations to unappreciative audiences, present company accepted, of course. I do this in order to build up my pension and inheritance for their benefit. We also find that clients tend to gravitate to advisors of a similar age. Now, I appreciate your mileage may vary. I don't know the makeup of all your businesses, but this certainly allows firms to become the bridge between the different generations of family and it will build stronger and longer term relationships. As I said before, families find it difficult to discuss money. So this is where advisors provide, um, advisors provide a much needed service. Again, you could be thinking, well, is there a so what to this? Well, if you were to purchase an existing advisory business, how much would you pay if all the clients are retired and their assets reducing compared to, say, a business with a healthy range of clients of different ages? This consideration affects providers as well as advisor firms. So after all, the average age of a client on, on platforms in the UK is something like 58 years old. So we have aging clients and dare I say, and please don't be offended, an, an aging advisor population. So we do need new blood into the industry. And as I said before, quite often discussing wealth between the generations is still a taboo subject. It causes concerns. I think the picture here is really apt. I mean, how many times have you bent over backwards to help your nearest and dearest? The older generations have fears about running out of money or creating that entitlement mentality in their kids. You may have overheard someone say that the timely passing away of a close relative will result in being able to get on the housing ladder or even pay off the mortgage. There are also fears about heirs squandering their inheritance and that dreaded sideways inheritance that I mentioned earlier. That effectively is where parents worry about their own kids marrying or living with a partner not of their liking. Now, what really brings this into focus is a colleague of mine observed a consumer group discussing intergenerational planning. If you think that the attendees all had in excess of a quarter of a million pounds to invest, some were retired, others still in work, they all had kids. There's also a mixture of those that had advisors and those that didn't. But in situations like this, it's really a case of you don't know what you don't know. It's very easy for us in the industry with our rational view of financial planning and tax affairs to forget just how far removed we are from the reality of the level of knowledge of the average person. All the participants had a certain level of knowledge about finance, but lack the, the finer detail. For example, there was a lot of discussion about income tax implications of gifting money to kids and grandkids, but they never actually arrived at the solution. Another view you may find interesting, or, or dare I say it amusing, was from a lady saying she was concerned about being ripped off by high advisor fees. So that was why she was with SJP. And to back it up, she said they do charts and things. So if you want to win over your clients, charge high fees and do lots of charts and things and you can't go wrong. What is interesting, though, is that among the group, there was a real attitude towards new sons and daughter-in-laws coming into the family. The threat of future divorce and the subsequent taking of their hard-earned wealth weighed really heavily. One participant said he and his wife actively hate the daughter-in-law. Another stated they had a strange relationship with their son and didn't want to be in front of him going down the stairs. I mean, the real key, though, is, is to decide to somehow ring fence their money and protect it. Another area that really struck home was their attitude to debt was so much different to that of their children. They believe their children treat debt as just another subscription to be paid and that younger generations don't appreciate securing capital. They viewed that simply passing on their money to their kids to pay off their accumulated debt was a negative. The complexity of families and, and natural personal biases that come with it provides us all with the challenge to how best to serve these people and guide them to what they really need. We can help them, though. We can utilise tax wrappers to promote tax efficiency and maintain control of their wealth. Again, one of the biggest concerns affecting the, you know, the older generation would be that, you know, and again, we've got statistics to back it up, that transfers of wealth could be delayed due to concerns regarding care costs. Now, it was great. The recent announcement by the government may go, go some way to address this. However, working kids will now be less well off due to the forthcoming hike in national insurance rates. They may, to, may need to rely on the bank of mum and dad even more. You've probably heard the phrase the bank of mum and dad. It, it's well used, but research has shown the amount given to younger generations to get them on the housing ladder is the equivalent of being something like the UK's 11th largest lender. Back in 2019, I think it was something like 6.3 billion were actually passed on to get kids or grandkids on the housing ladder. Now, you can read this slide just as well as I can read it out to you. But one thing that really stands out for me is that a quarter of over 55s want to hold on to their money when ideally they could be transferring wealth now more efficiently with better timing using tax wrappers available. 
For example, making smaller regular contributions to junior ISAs and pensions can be used to build up nest eggs without compromising their future standards of living and retaining the all important control that they would require. On the flip side, younger generations, they've got their own concerns as well. And perhaps the main one is, is the desire to get on the property ladder. Yet we've got a significant trend in the UK. There's been the shift away from home ownership towards private renting. Of course, one number of factors, we've got a shortage of housing. It's driven up house prices, makes property purchase unaffordable for some. Also, we've got a growing supply of rented accommodation, mostly owned by the, the older generations as it happens, and other shifts in society, such as the gig economy and a more flexible workplace. Uh, for workforce, I should say, or making renting a more popular choice. I mean, the real takeaways for me from this slide are that it's estimated that one in four households will be renting this year. The majority of renters are aged under 45 and staggering number 37% have been renting for in excess of 10 years. So given that home ownership without the support of older generations is perhaps becoming a distant dream for many, renting is, is becoming the new norm. So let's now consider ways of passing on that wealth to the next generations to help them build their future, but also provide peace of mind for the older generations that their retirements won't be compromised and they can still keep control over where their money goes. So allow me to introduce Billy and Jean to you. They wish to save for their lovely granddaughter, Janet. No, they've got an IHT liability of £100,000, something both Embark and Thornton's coming on next can help with. At this moment in time, they'd rather not make outright gifts as they still may need to pay thousands for their care due to time scale for introduction of care caps. What's the potential solution? Well, they could make contributions into Janet's junior ISA, up to £9,000 per year, in fact. If we take these contributions and apply a modest 2% growth rate net of charges, by the time Janet reaches 18, she could potentially have a nest egg of over £170,000. This could be used for education, and maybe future house purchase. Additionally, moving the money out of the estate means that Billy and Jean could potentially save IHT of around £57,000 based on, on current rates. Now, if required, they could use their individual annual exemptions of £3,000 per year to maximise tax efficiency, or even make the contributions as gifts out of normal expenditure if their circumstances allow. But as far as keeping control goes, once Janet reaches 18, she can legally take over the junior ISA, do what she wishes with the money. That's why they're, they're fondly called motorbike funds. Think about yourself for a moment. If you were 18, what would you have done if you suddenly found £170,000 available at your fingertips? Would you have invested it wisely? Exactly. And think about yourself now at your current age. What would you do if £170,000 appeared? Well, let's not go there, but let's get back to planning. When Janet turns 18, Billy and Jean could help fund a lifetime ISA. They could contribute up to £4,000 per year and secure that juicy 25% government bonus of up to £1,000. Whilst being safe in the knowledge, Janet cannot get her hands on the lifetime ISA monies unless it's for house purchase or later life. If they were feeling super generous, they could also have helped fund an adult cash ISA when Janet reaches 16, as well as the junior ISA. I mean, I, th I think ISAs really are the gift that keep, keep on giving, and they're great vehicles to preserve family wealth, as we can see here. Flexi ISAs are really useful. They allow us the ability to take a withdrawal, yet still keep our subscription open. A great way of helping family members out if the pandemic has made times tough for them, safe in the knowledge your ISA can be replenished. There's also no CGT liability incurred when disinvesting from an ISA and even better, the income received won't interfere with your tax bans or trigger any tax traps. You could, of course, take the income from your pension to help out your nearest and dearest. However, this could in some circumstances trigger the reduced money purchase annual allowance if you were to take a regular income, for example, or diminish the value of your pension pot and you'd lose all that lovely IHT free goodness that pensions have. Now, in addition to ISIS, I think pensions are an absolutely fantastic way of transferring wealth without having to make large outright gifts. They allow the donor to keep a high level of control. In this example, we've got Georgina, typical of the people I mentioned earlier. Um, she fears the addition of a new partner she doesn't particularly approve of into her son's life. Her son, Nigel, is self-employed single dad, and she's looking to help him as best she can. She wants to ease the burden of, burden of his living costs, but also pass on her wealth in a way that means it won't be spent on debt subscriptions or by any new partner that may turn up. 
Now, Georgina is making plans for Nigel, but also with a view to keeping money back for potential care costs in the same way Billy and Jean did. So what's the potential solution? Georgina's considered savings, but never pensions. If she makes contributions to Nigel's pension, she is effectively easing the burden of his current outgoing because he's not having to pay for them himself. If Nigel was employed as opposed to self-employed, it would still be the case. I think if he was in a, an auto enrolment scheme, he'd have to pay something like five percent contribution, maybe higher if he's part of a group arrangement with higher contribution levels. So by saving Nigel the money that he would have put into his pension, she's allowing him to divert this money to bring up her grandkids or, or for vital family expenditure. In addition to effectively locking in the pension to it will be about age 57 by the time Nigel gets hands on it, um, it can't be spent on other things. So Georgina is safeguarding Nigel's future. He'll also benefit from tax relief at his highest marginal rate. And Georgina could potentially avoid future IHT liabilities in the same way that Billy and Jean could. Paying into another person's pension is not just something for older children. Parents and grandparents can also contribute to junior pensions. In this example, we have George. He's now retired. He built a successful business when he was younger. In addition to his lover's cake, as you can see from the picture, he loves his granddaughter, Michaela, and would like to save for her future. That's not all. Ideally, he'd like to provide her with something that could be used as a business asset in the future. He's considered savings plans and investments to do this, but not necessarily pensions. If George was kind enough to fund a junior pension arrangement, he contribute to an asset that again, if we, we put in that 2% per annum growth less charges, that could be worth something like 58,000 time by the time she gets to 18. That's assuming he contributes the full 3,600 allowance each year, of course. But don't forget that contribution will also attract tax relief at 20%, so effectively netting the contribution down to 2,880. The monies are effectively locked in, but it could be used as a business asset. You could use SIP rules. So when Michaela's older, she could, if she started to do, wanted to set up her own business, she'd have that little nest egg in a pension arrangement. And again, once again, potential IHT savings to be made. Um, and if George decided he could no longer keep paying in, then Michaela's parents could, of course, take over and keep the contributions going. I think you know, making contributions to the next generation pensions is a massively powerful planning tool. It offers tax advantages and a real degree of control and security. You can see the benefits to both donor and recipient are many. The donor potentially reduces the value of their estate for IHT purposes. As I said before, they can use their £3,000 annual gift exemption or the normal expenditure rules. A fantastic way of overcoming client fears about losing control of their hard earned or it being squandered but proactively helping save for the next generation's retirement in a tax efficient way. But the recipient, they, they receive tax relief at their highest marginal rate, despite the fact contributions didn't actually originate from their own funds. It can also help avoid tax traps, such as child benefit trap, by extending the basic rate band of the recipient. And of course, that person is gonna enjoy all the wonderful tax efficiencies that pensions can offer. We're getting towards the end now, I'm sure you'll be thrilled to know, but I thought it might be worth mentioning some good industry practice. You may already be doing this for your clients. I know for sure a certain well-known national advice firm that popped up in conversation earlier is. Effectively, they're making it easier for clients, in particular the next generation, to deal with their parents' affairs upon death, or if illness strikes, or in case a power of attorney needs to be applied. Investing a little time now to record these details will save surviving partners or children a great deal of time and possibly hassle in the future. Having access to key facts and vital documents which can be located easily when the need arises is hugely valuable. Here's an example of some of the documentation which could be included. Now you'll obviously have your own views as to what is important. A simple record of gifts, trusts and settlements is also recommended for IHT purposes. Now here I've just recorded dates gifts were made and the amounts involved. As you can see, I was quite thirsty when I put the slides together, so I thought I'd use fine wine as an example of, of something that was, was gifted. But having spoken to quite a few advisors, I know many of you are actively engaged in working with the different generations and already recording these important details of the family for, to fall back on. Uh, with that in mind, when it comes to mainstream tax wrappers, ISAs, pensions, junior pensions, junior ISAs, platforms and the Embark platform have the functionality and technology to, to bring that to the fore. 
With any of the previous scenarios, all the family's money could be held in the same place. It would make managing their combined assets and wealth easier. We can offer all this for you and your clients. We have those tax wrappers and all the functionality shown on the previous uh, case studies. I'm just going to give you now a quick reminder of our learning outcomes. And again, as I said, you'll get CPD for this session. I really want to thank you for listening today. I'm now going to pass you over to David from Thorntons, who's got an excellent presentation lined up for you. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, uh, my name is David Holmes from Thorntons Investments. Um, and uh, hopefully everything's coming up fine on the screen. That's always the, uh, uh, the slight worry, but um, um, thanks to Neil for that, uh, for his session. And in the next session, I'm going to talk about uh, the flexibility of using uh, investment in AIM company shares uh, for inheritance tax planning. Um, now we're going to uh, look to cover uh, three main areas from this. Uh, the first one will be to look at the mechanics of uh, business relief and AIM and how they interact in terms of IHT planning. Uh, and then we'll come to look at, um, you know, the, if you like, the uh, putting this into practice in terms of uh, some uh, client scenarios uh, where clients would uh, would or may benefit from considering this as part of their IHT planning. Uh, and the third main part of the session um, is to look at the Embark platform and where Embark adds value in terms of having uh, uh, the Thornton's AIM solution available uh, on the platform. And certainly part of the reason behind the growth of this uh, form of investment has been through the availability of A models on third party platforms. But by way of introduction, um, I suppose the first point I would make there is in terms of IHT planning, there is only really one reason why uh, uh, an investor would want to uh, engage in IHT planning, and that's quite simply to be able to, uh, to pass on uh, as much of their wealth as possible to beneficiaries, to their loved ones, to families uh, after they're gone. Uh, and in terms of AIM investment for IHT planning, as we'll come on to see, uh, this offers a, a very flexible solution uh, that may work in a number of different uh, client scenarios. But as I mentioned as well, the, the, the growth in, in part uh, is due to the flexibility of this as a planning solution, but it's also down to the availability on third party platforms. And we'll come on to see um, the uh, added value that that can bring, particularly in terms of cost efficiency uh, and uh, admin efficiency savings as well. And the final part, and I suppose linking back to what Neil was talking about there in terms of intergenerational planning, um, by nature, this is a lifetime investment. Uh, the investor has to uh, be holding the AIM investment uh, until death, uh, having held for at least two years for this to be effective. So the relationship you're going to be having with your clients is absolutely a lifetime investment. And not only that, but for the reasons that, that Neil was talking about through, through his presentation, um, you know, estate planning is not really just about the investor. It should also be about involving their family uh, as well. Uh, and so that conversation is, is one that if you're involved in uh, and getting the relationship with the family members, that hopefully over time, they'll become clients of your business uh, as well. So I suppose the first point to consider uh, is the mechanics in terms of business relief and AIM and how that kind of all uh, comes together for, for IHD planning. So the first one we'll look at is the AIM market, the alternative investment market. Uh, the AIM market has been a major success story for the UK economy. It celebrated its 25th anniversary last year, uh, and, and over that time, it's helped nearly 4,000 smaller companies in the UK uh, to, to raise the capital to grow and develop their business, research and development, employment, new products and services. And it's raised in that time, the stats are published monthly, but the most up-to-date ones, it's raised uh, nearly £127 billion. Uh, and in terms of numbers of companies, the numbers at the moment, well, precisely about 836. When I first put this presentation together uh, back in 2017, when we launched our model portfolio of a model, model portfolio, there was around about a thousand companies or so. So the numbers have come down, uh, but that's still uh, a healthy number. And the market cap, uh, as you can see there, uh, around about 152 billion is, is certainly very sizable. Now, some of those companies may qualify for business relief, not all. Um, and in terms of when you look at the companies that are held on the AIM register, it's probably fair to say that most will, will, will not be recognisable. Uh, there's certainly a, a, a fair number there um, that uh, would fall into that bracket. But a few of the companies I think would be well known, uh, certainly to yourselves and, and to your clients. Uh, and these are companies that we hold in our AIM portfolio. So top left there, uh, Jet2, formerly Dart Group, 
Um, uh, and on the, the right hand side there, Fever Tree. Uh, I used to be, I used to say that, uh, you know, for those that don't recognise it, that's a picture of a pub, uh, but obviously things are reopening again. Uh, so Jet 2, Fever Tree, Boohoo as well, uh, probably a sign of uh, the change in times in, in the last couple of decades or so uh, with online retailing. So Boohoo and ASOS as well, uh, who are on the uh, uh, AIM list, um, massive success stories. Uh, and now uh, um, uh, basically companies that are uh, much bigger now than likes of Marks and Spencers, uh, who have been around since the 1880s. So reflective of, of, of the changing times. On the bottom left, another stock in our portfolio is H&T Pawnbrokers, which probably uh, sadly is a reflection of the times we've been living through, have, have been doing very well, but um, certainly is a, a stock that may be well known to, to, to some investors, certainly. The other two here, they're not on the aim list uh, just now. This, they, they used to be, which is why I've included them here, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that, that most, if not all, will, will be familiar with Dobby's uh, and, and Domino's Pizza's very successful companies that started life out on AIM and, and, and did very successfully uh, on the back of that. Now, the way the business relief works, uh, it effectively reduces the value of qualifying business assets as far as inheritance tax is concerned, either by 50% or in the case of uh, shares in AIM listed, listed companies by 100%. Now, there are very stringent qualification rules around that. You're looking at 100% business relief being available for sole traders and, and partnerships uh, and shares and unquoted companies. So generally speaking, they tend to be wholly or, or mainly uh, trading businesses where the activity is, is, is trading activity is over a half of the uh, activity of the business. Examples of businesses that wouldn't qualify uh, if more than half of the business is basically looking at um, dealing in stocks and shares or, 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 or lands and buildings or making and, and holding investments. Um, so there's there's no definitive list. You, you know you can't go online and get a list of companies that today qualify for business relief. And a big part of what we do at Thornton Investments, um, uh, the portfolio managers, is to keep on top of this. You know on a daily basis they're going in, uh, they're checking company news, uh, they're going on calls and so on, um, just to ensure to the best of, of, of our ability that those those shares uh, are still qualifying. In terms of the relief itself, an investor has to hold the, the shares for a minimum of two years and still be holding the shares at death in order to qualify. And all claims for business relief uh, after death are made uh, to HMRC by the executor. So they will go through, it's actually the IHT 412 forum, if you're unfamiliar with that, that will list each stock. It will have a column will, that will say if it's been held for two years or more, and HMRC will then go in and, uh, and check each stock for qualification. Um, now, uh, should one stock fail qualification, then the good news for the investor in a portfolio of AIM shares is it's just that stock that wouldn't qualify. It doesn't disqualify the, the whole portfolio. So a very simple example. This is a very basic example, um, and I'm assuming that the, there's no nil rate band or residential nil rate band available. But if you contrast £200,000 into a GIA, on the one hand, uh, uh, in, in non-AIM investments, and on the other into an AIM uh, portfolio. Uh, should the investor die within the first two years, then IHT will be payable irrespective. After two years, um, then on the AIM route, that's expected to be outside the estate, so we'll be free from IHT. And the difference you can see there at 40% is that uh, the AIM route will save that £80,000 that would otherwise be liable, uh, leaving the full £200,000 uh, to be passed down to beneficiaries. Now, in terms of estate planning, uh, inheritance tax, you may have heard this described before as a voluntary tax. And that's quite simply because there are a number of uh, well-established estate planning solutions available uh, to investors. Um, and of course, including the, the, uh, the AIM solution. So the next slide, which and I, I, I like this slide because it, it contrasts quite nicely the pros and cons. It's a wee bit busy, but if I can ask you to look at the top right hand side there, we've got the AIM shared portfolio. And I've highlighted the two main benefits to the investor from going down this uh, this route. The first one is the speed of relief. The idea that you just have to have been invested in the portfolio for two years, that contrasts um, with, for example, gifting or the use of trusts where the survival period is seven years. So you, you may already be beginning to think of your own clients and clients in those circumstances where a two year survival uh, is, is, is much more attractive. 
And the other main benefit is the 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 the, the, the fact that investors will still retain access to capital. This essentially is an investment in a portfolio of direct equity shares. So uh, the investors can still access the capital as and when they, they, they need to withdraw uh, in, in any capital from that. Now, of course, this is set up as an IHT planning solution. So you may argue that you may want to leave that intact, but certainly the, the option is there. Um, we're also looking at potential for growth. Certainly, although the primary objective of our AIM service is the IHT uh, uh, planning side, uh, and, and, and offering a portfolio which is uh, 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 outside the state, uh, there is a potential for growth and we certainly have that in mind in terms of the stock selections that we have in the portfolio to generate that growth uh, over the longer term. I'll touch on uh, uh, the power of attorney situation when we come to look at uh, client scenarios, but that's certainly uh, uh, an option or one of the, the, the angles which is open to you and, and to your clients. Uh, and the fact as well that this is uh, an investment in shares, so there's no medical evidence. And again, you know, you might contrast that with, for example, uh, taking out a life assurance plan or where your, your client has a discounted gift trust. In terms of the risks, well, I'll cover this in a separate slide. And, you know, this is a, a higher risk investment. It is 100 percent UK smaller company investment. So um, so the, the client should certainly be aware that there is potential here for capital loss. Uh, although again at Thornton's Investments, a big part of what we do in the portfolio is risk management and look to kind of mitigate that uh, 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 that uh, potential for loss. I've mentioned already about business relief uh, not being uh, guaranteed and also linked in there, and this is the same I suppose uh, uh, across the spectrum for, for uh, any kind of tax planning, uh, is that uh, tax rules are subject to change. Liquidity, liquidity is an issue as well. Uh, uh, to date, we haven't had any liquidity issues with uh, our own portfolio, but certainly uh, there, are, there, there could well be liquidity issues if there are difficulties with, with uh, certain companies and certain stocks. Um, uh, a more recent example, go back a couple of years or so now, was uh, Patisserie Valerie, uh, who got into difficulty, and certainly that would cause uh, issues for any investors looking to make withdrawals uh, out of the portfolio. And the last point here, uh, certainly wouldn't be looking at an aim portfolio being, if you like, the investor's core investment. Uh, the idea here is very much used for IHD planning, but you, you wouldn't be looking to, to, to put kind of all your eggs in, in one basket. So that's the rules and the mechanics and how it works. But in terms of putting these in, into practice, the next part of the session is to look at, if you like, different client scenarios and to highlight the flexibility of aim investment in terms of IHD planning. So I think the first point to, to address is when we think back to that to earlier slide in terms of speed and access, this idea that the survival period here is only two years and how that contrasts with, with, with other planning uh, uh, options. And the fact as well that the investor retains control here and can access a capital at any time. And of course, with no, no health evidence required. So if you're thinking about your own client bank and clients that this may be uh, uh, attractive to, um, example here, and again, this harks back to the points that Neil was making in the earlier presentation. Those clients who are simply reluctant to gift assets uh, and, and, and lose access to, to their wealth. I mean, I think the figure I wrote down, nearly a quarter over 55s, don't want to do that. So if there is a reluctance here, then you have a, an option to say to them, oh, look, you know, you can invest in this, you have access at any time, and if you need to access capital, it's available to you. Um, as well as that, of course, clients with health concerns uh, and are, are sadly facing the prospect of a, a reduced life expectancy. So by that, I'm not talking about, you know, within, say, the next 12 to, to 24 months because of the way the rules work here. But certainly as an option here where the seven year survival is a concern to them, uh, two years may be more, more palatable. And if you have clients who in later life, um, you know, perhaps the, there's no inheritance tax planning in place, or there is, but it now turns out that for different reasons, it's no longer adequate. Uh, for example, your clients may have recently downsized. They finally managed to get rid of the kids uh, and they've uh, they've downsized as capital that's come into the account and that's causing an issue in terms of, of, of IHT. Uh, so all those may be clients that uh, would, uh, would be worth uh, considering for, uh, for investing in, in, in this sort of service. Now, ISAs as well, again, kind of Neil, Neil covered uh, um, some of the key attractions of ISAs, as I'm sure you're aware that, um, you know, your, your own clients will be enjoying uh, the, the, the tax efficiency that that offers in terms of no tax on income or, or, or the growth. Um, 
when it comes to ISA season, I think almost every ISA season uh, I, I read, uh, there's usually a survey or something that comes out, uh, and that is highlighting the number of investors who, although they're familiar with the tax benefits of an ISA, are unfamiliar that uh, an ISA will fall into their estate on death. And I think those surveys are quite consistent, around about half of those surveyed. And these are individuals who uh, will have a potential IHT problem. It's not just stopping anyone in the street and, and pulling these stats together. So these are individuals who are investing in ISAs who could have an ISA, an ISA uh, uh, IHT problem uh, that um, uh, uh, they were unaware of. Um, now, a solution here is that um, certainly since 2013, AIM shares uh, have been allowed to be held uh, within an ISA. Um, and if, by doing so, you, you effectively you add IHT planning uh, to the existing ISA tax benefits which are available. And this is where a platform um, such as Embark comes into its own because it's you know, very easy if your client has existing ISA investment on Embark to, to switch those ISA holdings on the platform or from an external ISA manager, perhaps where there's no uh, in-house uh, solution there uh, to move your client's size of money across into uh, the AIM solution. Um, and not just for older clients, for younger clients as well, and by younger, uh, maybe those in, in say the, the 50s or, or 60s, who if they were to consider uh, making their annual ISA subscriptions into the AIM portfolio at 20,000 a year, this allows them to start their IHT planning at, at a younger age and start uh, start the clock ticking uh, on, on, on that. So younger, younger clients, uh, this, may, this may be of interest too. And there is an angle here for um, uh, for spouses or, or, or civil partners, where on the death of the, the, the first uh, individual, the surviving spouse or civil partner can accept their partner's ISA into their own ISA using the adi uh, additional permitted subscription. And by doing that, by moving the AIM portfolio across on an in-specie basis, then you avoid having to reset uh, if you like the timer <coughs> on the on the two year requirement, uh, contrast that to effectively liquidating the in portfolio for the deceased portfolio, paying that into cash, and then a cash investment coming in that would start the clock. So there is an angle here to allow the the, the effectively the, the period of time to to port across, um, and it, and it may be the case there that the two year uh, um, uh, requirement doesn't doesn't kick in. Now these are probably some of the the, the better known uh, uses for for aim investment for IHT. Um, the next uh, three slides are really to cover perhaps some of the less well-known areas, uh, but certainly ones that will be of interest to clients that are in this kind of situation. The first one I'd like to look at is where your client uh, has their own business and has been talking to you about um, uh, selling the business. Perhaps family members are, are unwilling or, or unable to, to take on the running of the business. Uh, now, the way the rules work here is where business assets qualify for, for business relief, and in the case of a business that's sold, um, um, the proceeds of the sale, you know, you've got to question, what, well, what happens to those proceeds? If they end up sitting in your client's bank account, then there's a real danger here that they're going to be subject to IHT on death. So the angle here, and this is through the replacement property rules, is that if you replace uh, some or all of those proceeds, with another business relief qualifying asset, such as uh, an AIM portfolio, um, then you don't have to reset that to your clock. If you do it within a three year time period, then <coughs> effectively the business relief ports across. Uh, and so if there is an issue uh, in, in, in terms of uh, an IHT problem, uh, then the business relief, as I say, will, will be intact and will have moved over. And I can just picture the scenario where having sold the business, uh, the investor, you know, pops into the bank with the cheque in the back pocket, leaves uh, leaves uh, the bank looking for a pub, maybe for a drink to celebrate and sadly gets run over. So, you know, the, the prospect is very real here that uh, those proceeds will be subject to IHT. So this allows the uh, uh, the investor, your clients, uh, an opportunity uh, to protect that and, and to get IHT planning in place uh, um, yeah, fairly soon after, after the sale. This could be an angle, for example, I know talking to advisors about this, that uh, their accountancy connections, for example, uh, may benefit from hearing this. Um, and because of the way the rules work, uh, you can actually revisit business sales uh, within the last three years because you have up to three years to make that reinvestment. So if you have clients that have sold their business in, 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 in recent times, it'd be well, well worth perhaps uh, inquiring into that, seeing that was interest uh, to them. And of course, they will still have access to capital and the prospect for capital growth is, is very much still there. Now, Neil, another subject he touched on was uh, uh, the power of attorney situation and, and, and quite a low percentage actually 
uh, of, of those uh, individuals who may hold uh, a lasting power of attorney. Um, and, and one of the issues with, with holding lasting power of attorney, of course, is there are significant limitations for the attorney to make a lifetime gift uh, in terms of inheritance tax planning. So, um, so the angle here uh, in terms of aim investment is that where the, the power of attorney is worded appropriately to contain express instruction to allow the attorney to delegate investments to the discretionary manager, then this will allow investment to be made into uh, an aim portfolio to start that two year clock. And a further benefit, if you think back to what one of the, the, the rules here is that, again, uh, there's no, <coughs> there's an investment in, in shares, so there's no medical underwriting required here, irrespective of the, the medical condition for the for the, for the donee. Um, and this may uh, be a peace of mind factor, certainly there's access, because of the access to capital uh, being available, uh, then investment will, will, will still allow uh, the, uh, the client to access capital, for example, for healthcare uh, costs uh, and care home costs as well. And then whatever's left over, uh, when the client passes away, uh, it would be available if it's after two years to, to then be passed down free of IHT. Um, uh, one or two caveats on that, of course, um, you know, there, there, there has been some recent cases uh, where, if, you know, it has gone to court uh, and the judge has been quite particular that um, the, the wishes of the client very much have been around <coughs> estate planning uh, and, and uh, a desire to, to do that. So in other words, you know, has investment been done for the benefit of the client or has it been done for the, the, the benefit of the attorney? So uh, as long as uh, the, the conditions are well documented and the rationale and so on, then the, there shouldn't be any, any issues with this. And the final one, and again, th this is more just as an awareness, just to bring this really to, to your attention. Um, at Thornton's, we're very happy to kind of talk about this uh, with you in a, bit, in a bit more detail. But another angle here is for clients who are looking to make investments into uh, discretionary trust. And depending on the scenario, as you know, um, there may well be a 20% setup tax on that if it's above the nil rate band and subsequent periodic or exit charges kicking in there as well. Um, however, if the investment which is settled into trust uh, is an investment which is already a business relief qualifying, so it could, for example, be an investment in a portfolio which has been held for two years. If that's then made into the discretionary trust, then you can mitigate IHT charges in that there's no 20% setup charge and no subsequent periodic exit charges or charges on death. Um, now, there are a few caveats around that, uh, you know, and, and today's not the place to, to go through that. So, for example, the trustees have to continue to hold that investment within the, the AIM portfolio. But uh, again, this is really just to highlight this and, and we're happy to, to talk uh, more uh, another time with you if anyone wants uh, to discuss this. So that's the, the planning scenarios and, and I'm looking at flexibility. Uh, the last area to cover really here is, is um, if you like, the part of the reason for the growth, not only the flexibility, but also the, the, the growth of A-model portfolios on third party platforms. So uh, the Thornton's investment A-model is on the uh, Embark platform, and that really adds value in, in terms of what that brings to in, investors. Uh, the key areas, firstly, are in terms of admin efficiency. So, um, you know, clearly, if, the, if your client has other uh, investments held, on the Embark platform, then um, they don't have to move some of that investment off platform to a, a non-platform aim, aim manager. You can now retain those assets on platform and put a portion of that into, into uh, the aim portfolio. Uh, or, uh, you know, moving assets onto, onto platform as well uh, to, to retain all your clients' assets in one place. And in terms of the tax wrappers, uh, certainly the ISA and, and, and the ISA would be, I think we would get the majority of our, of our business coming into our own our own portfolio, but the ISA, the GIA uh, and uh, personal pension wrapper uh, as well, not, not, not from an IT perspective, um, but for someone looking at, uh, as an investment opportunity using UK smaller companies uh, uh, investment. The investment process, you'll be familiar yourselves with the platform, it is, is, is very straightforward. Uh, and one of the advantages of using the investment in the platform is it's very transparent. So you'll be able to go into the bonnet. You can see all stocks held in the portfolio. You can get portfolio valuations, uh, uh, performance information, so, and so on can be can be obtained. Full platform fa functionality, of course, is there. So for clients that are looking to take a withdrawal, uh, that's there. Uh, printing off transaction history reports. Um, you know other A managers. Typically, there'll be a charge, you know, for a probate inquiry. Well, you can 
produce the report on the platform as part of your service uh, for the executor on day. Uh, so that's all there. So certainly admin efficiencies is, is, a, is a big plus point. Um, I think, however, uh, the, the charges and, and, and the cost effectiveness uh, really come into their own here. Uh, and certainly using model portfolio on, on the Embark platform, uh, you know, once you actually start to compare and contrast numbers, uh, you, you, will, you will see that. Um, so in terms of the charges, our own fee, uh, we charge a uh, 1% AMC. And in July of this year, we made our NPS uh, models and our A model portfolio VAT exempt. Uh, now, um, <clears throat> uh, I, I can't say this as a, as a matter of fact, but uh, I'm pretty confident we are the only AIM manager not to charge VAT uh, on our AIM service. I certainly have not seen any other manager come out and say that. So I believe we, we are the, the, the first to do that, but I will, I will stand corrected. Um, and then you're looking at the Embark platform charges, which you'll know yourselves, you know what charge uh, structure you're on, but the standard terms at 15 bips. Um, and there's no other charges. So there's no initial charges, no withdrawal charges, no exit fees, no charge for probate, no charge for custody. Uh, those are charges you will find elsewhere. Uh, you'll not find those through using a service on the platform. And the last point there as well is that the dealing charges are negligible. So you're talking about a pound of trade on Embark. So our portfolio has 32 stocks. That would be a 32 pound dealing charge, whereas many of the, the non-platform A managers uh, will have typically a 1% charge on that. So to put that into perspective, I've, <clears throat> I've got a couple of examples just to put some numbers uh, together for you. And they're both based on, on the same scenario. Uh, where an investor looks to place £300,000 uh, AIM investment. Now, I'm assuming no growth. In reality, of course, um, you, you would expect certainly the longer term growth, growth to be there. Uh, I'm also assuming here that after death that uh, shares are sold as well. Um, and in terms of the, uh, if you like, uh, the other AIM provider, um, I suppose a, a, a typical representation of charges would be a 1% initial charge, a 1% deal in charge, and a, a, an AMC, in this case, 1.5% plus VAT. Um, now, to put that into perspective, I've taken the first scenario here, uh, if the investor were sadly to pass away after just one year. Now, of course, the whole purpose of going in here is to uh, um, uh, allow uh, the portfolio to, to be outside the estate. But uh, sadly, we, we, do, we have had a handful of cases where the investor hasn't survived two years. Uh, so it's very important as well to consider what the position would be, should that be the case. So this first scenario is where the investor has passed away after, after just one year. And you can see there with this 1% um, initial charge, it would be a £3,000 charge. A 1% deal in charge effectively acts as, as an initial charge as well. So there's £6,000 that's taken out of that investment from, from day one. And if you work that through, the portfolio turnover statistics you can see there um, you know, I think that's I think uh, that's that's realistic, particularly around maybe the 25 percent mark. That was our turnover for our own portfolio last year, although in the first two years we didn't turn the portfolio over a, a, at all. But based on those turnover statistics, you can see the, the potential saving just 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 after one year of running that through. If over the lifetime of the investment, more realistically, if the investor had held this say for 10 years, you can see the difference that that has made in terms of charges and the savings there at the end. And, and what I would say here is that, as I said at the start, for an investor who is uh, paying into this from the point of view of saving 40% IHT uh, to maximise the amount they're passing on to beneficiaries after death, I think it's also important to consider where the investment is held. So it's not just about the 40% tax saving, but also the additional savings that you can make through choosing the choice of, uh, of provider. And the last point to make there is that through the Embark platform, there are no investment delays, whereas you could contrast that with uh, other non-platform providers where you could see up to six month delay. And that's very important, particularly those with health concerns or those in later life. Getting that two year clock started and started quickly is very important. So we're just about the end of the session now. Uh, and just, just to finish off with our own service, uh, and again, I'll have to talk this in more detail with anyone, but. Uh, We've been running this service since 2006. We've been running it as a model portfolio on platform since 2017. It's well diversified with 30 to 40 stocks across 13 sectors. Uh, and you know, part of the reason for that allows us to, to manage the risk and control the, the risk within that. Uh, we look at a healthy dividend yield. It's pushing up towards 2%, which we don't reinvest. 
and that sits in cash to help cover most or all the charges. And you're looking at a minimum investment of £20,000. Um, the performance numbers are there. If you were to go into our website, we have a daily feed from um, uh, um, FE Analytics, and that will also give you the, the daily return and, and performance over a number of different time periods uh, as well. And last point really to make is that um, our service is only available through financial advisors on platforms. You won't be able, an investor won't be able to go through services such as uh, Wealth Club and, and, and others. Um, and because of that, we know that the client or the investor has had financial advice and fully understands both the benefits and the risks. I've mentioned we don't apply VAT, so this makes it a very cost effective service for your clients and we don't reinvest the dividend income, uh, which again, I think makes us uh, distinct uh, as well. So you don't have to go back in to the portfolio to read that for uh, for charges. Um, so thank you for, uh, uh, for your time. Uh, I hope you have seen in the last uh, half hour or so, this is a flexible solution. It uh, allows uh, uh, IHT uh, to be uh, actually uh, effectiveness to be available after only two years while retaining access to capital and allowing potential for growth. And as you can see, they are very much offering cost, both cost and efficiency savings through the Embark platform. So um, if you um, wish to contact me or my colleague Nick Shepherd, uh, who looks after uh, uh, advisors further, further south, our details are on the screen there. We would be delighted to hear from you uh, and, and discuss this further, but uh, thank you again. That's brilliant. Thank you, David. And, um, you know, I think it's important to thank you to um, to Neil as well. I think both you put on an excellent presentation there. Um, certainly learned a lot personally. I'm sure people listening have as well. There's no there's no questions that have come through um, as yet, which I think shows what a good job you've both done. Um, but a big thank you again for embark to you both for, for putting on that session. Really do appreciate it. Um, I think it's also important that I'll just pass on a quick thank you to everybody listening as well. Um, an hour of your time, hopefully well spent, but also a thank you for your support for the Embark platform. Um, I think everybody on here is a um, user of the Embark platform. You've all trusted us with your clients um, and it really is appreciated. So I want to give a personal thank you again for that. If anyone does have any questions that they um, think of when they're reflecting on the session this morning, please do reach out to your account managers. we will be more than delighted to help. Um, but as it stands, I just wanted to thank you again for joining today's session and uh, I wish you all a good day. Thank you.